أنت خالق كل شيء وربها فنرجوك الهداية ونهتدي بكتابك وبسنة رسولك صلى الله عليه وسلم وما افتح لنا فتحات العارفين وقربنا منك يا مولانا بتوفيقك وهدايتك إلى سرات مستقيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله So alhamdulillah we uh, gather again for a second class on Islam for Muslims Islam 101 for Muslims Because of the rain I think a number of people were unable to, to make it Which is not a problem Alhamdulillah كم من فئة خليلة غادبت فئة كثيرة بإذن الله The Quran teaches us not to worry about numbers but about quality How many times did a small group overcome a large group and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتِ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا Who created death and life to see, to show which one of you is best, not which one of you is most in actions. So last week we, we introduced the topic and we talked about the three different areas of focus that we're going to be going through, uh, insha'Allah. First is issues related to faith, which my experience, Muslim, Muslims, especially within at least the Sunni tradition, don't really have a strong grasp of. And then second will be actions and practices, and then the third will be um, to solve. And we're going to use the outline that's usually used by the Maliki madrasas of West Africa and Andalus and Morocco and Egypt. That's what I was taught, that's what I can teach. Today what we want to talk about is Iman. What is Iman? And when we think of Iman, it tends to be a lot of things that come to mind. But the word Iman comes from a word which means security and safety. The Prophet wasallam, his name is Amin, it's from the same word. Al-Aman means safety and security. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, Surah Quraysh, وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خوف. We protected them, we secured them from fear. Historically, Sunni scholars differed over the definition of Iman. But if we were to do something which is very important when we study, and that is to appreciate that you have scholars and then you have their epic or their era or their environment. And scholarship is always going to reflect something happening in the world around it. So we find the majority of Sunni scholars say that Iman is tasdiq bil qalb wa qawlu bil lisan. That Iman is the affirmation of the heart and then to say La ilaha illallah. You have other scholars, especially from some of the Hanabila, the early Hanbali theologians, who said that, and some of the Malikis, like Ibn Abi Zayd, that Iman is the affirmation of the heart, the testimony of La ilaha illallah, and then actions. So they made actions part of Iman. If you sometimes go online, you're going to find people arguing about this. For example, A'udhu Billah. There's some people who say that Imam Abu Hanifa came into the Irja. They say that Imam Abu Hanifa was Murji, meaning somebody who said, like, actions have no bearing on faith. Sometimes you find some people accusing some of the Hanabila of being khawarij, being like really extreme. But if we're to think about the historical epic of these different scholars, then we can appreciate that they're sort of like in the center, but there's not really much of a difference. Why? Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he lived towards the end of the Amawi dynasty. And towards the end of the Amawi dynasty, you had a group of people called Al-Khawarij. 
The Khawarij were actually the people who murdered Sayyidina Ali. Karam Allah. The Khawarij actually killed a number of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because these were people who said that the foundation of Iman is actions. So they were hyper-focused on practices. And if someone were to make a mistake, they would declare them as non-Muslims and kill them. So you have this group, it's a fitna. The Prophet ﷺ, he talked about them in authentic hadith. He said, khalq. They're the worst people. And the Prophet, thank you man. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said about them, they will recite the Quran and it will go, like it will go through their heart, like they'll read it, but it won't, like it'll go through their heart like an arrow goes to a deer. So Imam Abu Hanifa, he lives in an epic that is rocked with the Khawarij who are hyper-focused on actions. So he's very cautious when he defines faith because he's worried that if he says, for example, actions are part of faith, this may inadvertently support the Khawarij. So Imam Abu Hanifa, he believed that actions ikmalul iman they are like from the fruit of Iman, they are an outcome of Iman. But when people accuse Abu Hanifa, for example, as, of saying that he was marjid, that he did not believe actions were important to Iman, they're failing to appreciate why he was so cautious in what he said. And if you appreciate what I just said, and you, when you study history, if you studied history, then you're going to see that a lot of these debates amongst Sunnis on Aqidah they're not actually debating over the foundations, they're debating over the historical context that they may not be aware of. So for example, Imam Ahmed, Ibn Hanbal, who is kind of like almost the opposite of Sayyidina Imam Abi Hanifa in his definition of faith. He says, تَصْدِيقُ بِالْقَلْبِ قَوْلُ بِلِسَانِ وَعَمَلْ بِالْأَعْضَى Right, Imam Ahmed, Hamu said faith is to, test, to, 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 to verify it in your heart, to say it and to act on it. Why? Because Imam Ahmed is not dealing with the Khawarij. He's dealing with Mu'tazilites. The Mu'tazilites are the opposite of the Khawarij. But for them, like, actions aren't really a big issue. And al marjiiyah But if you look at what they say and their de definitions of Iman, there may be slight differences, but those differences aren't like how people are making them now because they're both doing what any responsible religious leader or teacher will do. They're looking after the, the needs of society, the needs of people. So Imam Ahmed doesn't want to support i'tizal, so he kind of amplifies this component of Iman. Sayyidina Imam Ab Abi Hanifa does not want to support the Khawarij so he wants to steer people away from going around and declaring people disbelievers because you kind of had something like this on your Instagram, I think yesterday. Like, just going off what people do. And if you look at scholars from that point on, whether it's Sayyidina Imam al-Razi, right, whether it's Imam al-Ghazali, and you study the historical context, you're going to find that they actually agree on the components of Iman, according to like Sunni orthodoxy but they're amplifying certain components vis-a-vis -vis others because of problems or challenges that they face. A great example of this in our time would be Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, right? Even though he's not like a theologian in that sense, but what does he focus on? He focuses on white supremacy. He focuses on white supremacy being like devilish, right? Being Dr. Sherman Jackson describes white supremacy as a form of shirk. A thousand years from now, can someone come and say, you know, Sherman Jackson hate white people, hates white people. So that's sort of what happened to these people is the point I'm making. And it's frustrating when we see people fighting over these issues that in fact they're sort of all on the same page. So the majority of Ahl Sunnah, they said that Iman is tasdiq bil qalb wa bi and that actions are the, what kind of complements that. Later, we find the majority after the Mu'tazilites, we find a shift towards tasdiq qawl amal. 
for us, this is not that important. The only reason I'm giving you this now is because you may run into this online. You may run into groups in Masajid. You may run into problems in the MSA. People are fighting over this, 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 this. So now what I'm trying to help you do is to like pull 30,000 feet above it all. Say, so just, just relax, man. You need to appreciate the historical context of what's going on. And that allows us then to like, in a broader way, appreciate scholarship instead of like, becoming like fanatics for this group or that group. It's very important. So like now, you, you find with ISIS and with other groups, you found like a shift towards tasawwuf amongst ulama, because they were worried that these people were going around and asking them questions about their iman. Imam Bukhari, when he was asked about his iman, he said, imtihan bida, right? To go around and ask people about their iman is an innovation. So appreciate sometimes that the, the parameters of theology are very rich, and very layered, and that they allow people to sometimes emphasize certain parts at a certain time. So my question to you all then is, college students, what components of Iman should be amplified for your generation? Yeah, that's why I did this whole, whole, whole setup was to get into this conversation, right? Like, mm -hmm. what would be in light of what we're seeing in America and the challenges that we face in this country and the opportunities, what components of Iman, testimony in the heart and the mind, bearing witness with my speech, and then actions being a, a complementary component of Iman. Now we can appreciate why the Prophet said that faith has 72 branches. Which of those branches would you amplify now in this country? And I'm going to give you like a few minutes to kind of chat about it. Maybe come up with an agenda. And this is why we have to really appreciate what Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz did in such a short time. That he was able to contextualize religious teachings in a way that addressed some of the most important issues of the day. So for brothers who just joined us, may Allah bless you, it's raining, it's not easy, mashallah, to make it. We were talking about how, if you look through history, as we're talking about Iman today, you're going to find different definitions of Iman. And then sometimes now you go like on whatever, TikTok, I don't know, Instagram, forums, of this style of forums, AIM, you know, Khalid probably remember AIM, but you find people like arguing over what this scholar said, this scholar said this, this scholar said this, and you know, you find people attacking Audhu Billah Imam Abu Hanifa, attacking Al Ghazali, attacking this scholar, attacking this scholar. The point that I made is you cannot take the epistemological framework of any given scholar without appreciating his or her historical context. Like Rabi al-Adawiyya, her theology is largely a theology of love. Think about her life. She was abused as a child. She was abused as a wife. She went through like tremendous trauma. So her, her way to perhaps even self-medicate is to find love through God. Mm -hmm. Now like, we can appreciate her context. So as I was talking about Abu Hanifa, of course, is coming at the end of the Umayyad period and you have the Khawarij who are from the end of the Umayyad period to the beginning of the Abbasi period, who are just slaughtering people based on actions, killing people based on practices. Now you can appreciate early books in the why people like al Tahawi says, you know, al Muslimun kulluhum awliya or Rahman. All the Muslims are friends of God. Why Imam al Tahawi will say, like, we don't declare anybody a disbeliever for sins they make. Why is he saying that? There's obviously something he feels needs to be said to equalize the setting socially and religiously. Now we don't have that opportunity. We just take, this scholar said this, I'm going to make a meme out of it. This scholar said this, I'm going to, and then I put it out there without the context, and then I attack people. Whereas those scholars actually may have been on the same page, it's just the demands of an epic at times force us to amplify certain components of Islam. So the example I gave is Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz, right? Malcolm X, he's not a theologian, right? 
But mashallah, what he accomplishes in addressing the problems of his community and the community that he lives amongst America, through the lens, when he writes his letter back home and says, you know, America needs Islam. And then he begins to medicate so many issues in America that at least theoretically Islam fixes. Muslims, that's a whole nother discussion. But theoretically Islam is giving us the raw materials to handle it. So my question is, and I gave the example Imam Abu Hanifa with the Khawarij, and then Imam Ahmed, people may wonder, why are the, 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 the Hanbalis like very literal, although they change later on? Because Imam Ahmed is dealing with hyper-rationalists, the Mu'tazilites. So they're engaging their discourse, and it's always important to know, who are they talking to? So then I said, for this demographic, this age group, right, we can break up into groups maybe for mm -hmm. five or ten minutes and come with a list of what are the issues. I'll give you an example. Climate change. Climate change is an issue of theology. Number one, Allah says, Wala tusrifu, don't waste. And then number two, my choices that I make in life and how I live and what I purchase are causing pain somewhere in the world. So how do I limit the pain I cause. So I think that, you know, and I know in, in Indonesia, the ulama of Indonesia, they gave about 10 years ago a fatwa that it's haram to chop down trees in Indonesia. Their whole thing was that, you know, Allah has made us khalifa on the earth, and the earth is a trust, and we have a responsibility, and even the tree wept for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the, the stones and trees used to send salam to him, Alayhi salatu salam. So there is some kind of responsibility, mutual relationship. So inshallah, everybody can jump into some groups, maybe a little circle, and talk about what are the issues facing 20 year olds in 2021 that perhaps different components of our theology can speak to. Those people on Zoom, I can I can engage. I guess the people on Zoom. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Khaled is, is not twenty yet. <laughs> Crazy man. <laughs> That's an issue, ageism.
Shall we have like two minutes, guys? Two minutes to save the world.
Alrighty, let's come back to to the table. Mehem, would you mind um, if you can look and see what people wrote there? Yeah. I'm sorry about that. I'm not able to make that stretch. So let's hear from. Uh, I heard. I heard something really nice. I heard, you know, we're like to be religious is to be like a heretic, a heretic in modernity. I thought that was a great. Uh, a great quote. But let's hear from people who wants to share. They're so shy. <laughs> this is better than the rain. Yeah. And the soldiers and firemen. Yeah. All right, Bismillah. Please say your name and. Uh, my name is Yamanaster. And I was going to say that you want to kind of have to do with yourself your personal belief and connection with Allah because if you really don't believe you won't really have a strong Islam or dream mm. so you kind of have to get to Allah to be a relationship with Allah first before you can like start following because like someone said this last week but if you don't believe you don't know what you're doing so you have to believe first like for me I didn't believe as much but then studying that it's all on my own and then I thought that when you could doubt would bring me closer to Allah and it was dead. So that's why I can start working on me long now. Yeah, I think I think this is something that people don't talk about. This is an age that gives us so much license to be free. But very rarely do we assume responsibility for our own iman. How do you how do you do that? Where's the self help book on like how do I do it? You know? Um and that's something that I see, it's ironic, because you can basically do whatever you want in this age. Uh, yet people, I meet a lot of people like yourself, like, you know, I just picked up a book and started reading, or, you know, I attended some class, and, you know, things changed. So the, the, the confidence to assume responsibility for our, our own learning and growth, I think, is something that's a challenge. Because it goes back to what I heard and talked about over here, like being a faithful person doesn't necessarily put you in the current of like society. Mm -hmm. It puts you against that current sometimes. So that can be challenging. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Anyone on this side want to jump in? Yes. You guys are so vocal. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly. <laughs> yes. Um, I mentioned this in a group earlier. I told my but I feel like racism is a really big problem in Islam mm. because there's a lot of Muslim brothers and sisters that don't even want to be associated with black Muslims. Like the mosque near my house, my family doesn't attend there because we don't feel welcome there. So it kind of turns people away from the religion. So I feel like that's something we should tackle too. Absolutely. And then, and then the, the challenge is we read these theories, Islam, like we said in Malcolm's letter, there is the raw materials to solve all these problems, and then we don't even see it in our own communities. Yes, your name, please. Uh, Mia, uh, I think, uh, I mean, we see that a lot. I mean, I saw that at my own masjid between Arabs and, uh, and, 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 and 
Pakistani people, you know, it's, it's actually they're like pretty much all Muslims um, from different cultural backgrounds. I don't know if it's if it's as, I mean, I'm just asking here. I don't know if it's as much of a race thing as it is culture, cultural difference. Uh, if that, if there is a, a vocabulary difference, if it's significant. Sound like our conversation we had, I think, a week ago, you and I, right? Um, you know, I don't know. I, I, I do think that there's a post-colonial hangover. And I do think that whiteness, as a, as a measurement for, like, it's just, whiteness is seen as like a default of success. As it's, as it's presented in the world, and how it's been forcibly presented in the world. Um, how would religion help us to exercise that from ourselves? As a white person, it's a different responsibility. As a community, how do we exercise the demons of white supremacy from ourselves? I think is something that we learn with Iblis and Adam at the very beginning, right? I'm better than him. And that's why he goes to hell. <laughs> he, that's why he becomes Iblis, right? So I do think that theology has a very strong voice. I think it's an interdisciplinary challenge. Because this hits like sociology, anthropology, history, when I lived in Egypt, Amira, uh, Amira is Masriya, so I can tell her this story. There was a cream called Be White Cream. And it was on a, a big truck. It said, Kun Ebiald, Be White. So I went up to the guy that was selling Be White Cream. And I was like, if I use that, what will happen to me? Will I become invisible? And he was like, <laughs> but I said, like, what is this? What is this, man? You know? And he was like, And that's another thing. Like, the drive for earning is also at times set to appeasing whiteness. Islam has a lot to say about that. And I think at a at a macro level, it's we see what happened with the Haitian, but we pray for brothers and sisters in Haiti, right? Mm -hmm. You can't destabilize a country and then wonder why they want to come to your country. I mean, that's just since 2010. I mean. And then the pictures that were shown of people that were purposely kind of put out there. This is problematic. So I, I think that this is a big topic, and I think that's why BMI it's like that's it's a very important initiative. How do you begin to start these conversations that eventually move beyond conversations to policy? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're listening. All of us right now, we're here, hearing Naomi, I think you said Na Naomi? Naomi. Naomi, telling us her experience. As soon as we hear this, we should automatically be the opposite of that experience for any person we run into, any human being we run into in the masjid is black. We have to remember this moment if we're truly committed to one another. The Naomi said she went to the masjid and her family doesn't even go to the mosque because they don't feel welcome. How do you then structurally begin to address this? From the point of Tawheed, racism is a problem of Tawheed. So I agree. What, else, what are your other thoughts? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, here we talked about a couple of things. One of the things that we talked about is the issue of the LGBTQ and uh, the fact that uh, we're in college and we have friends coming out like left and right and uh, it's just pretty hard to know how to deal with it. Especially when it's like, if it's someone who you're not friends with, then like, okay, like I just have to try not to associate with this person. But if you're already a friend and the uh, situation come out like that, then just uh, I call it just, just you're put in a weird situation where like like a brother said it here where you are like the heretics and you are like the orthodoxy and that, that was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. So like I guess uh, that could be like related to Iman where like you could get like enough knowledge or confidence to be able to stand up to those situations because oftentimes we find ourselves like back in the corner where like you have to choose your words, you cannot express what you believe in, even though objectively, like, you are the one on the right and knowing how to deal with those situations. <coughs> I feel like it is a big Imani issue. Mm. Anyone else? 
Yes, sir. Like, it doesn't even specifically have to, like, you were talking about it, like, you use the, uh, like, the LGBT thing as, like, an example, but it doesn't even necessarily have to be that, like, it's the entire, like, liberal, like, small L, like, package that's kind of, especially over the past, like, 10, 15 years, has been, like, really, like, ramping up. And, you know, I don't really remember before then, because I was, like, four years old. <laughs> <laughs> I do kind of, like, even in my, like, lifetime, which is not that old. Yeah, you know what he's saying. I've noticed a very, very, like, noticeable just in the past, like, five years, you know. And it's like, I have little cousins who are, like, five, six years old who are going into school now. And I see the thing that, like, the things that they're telling them at that young age. And it really is, like, worrisome, you know, because, you know, inshallah, I'll have children. big worry for me is like what is it going to look like in 20 years and how are they going to be able to maintain like traditional conservative Islamic values when they're going through 20 years of that sort of like indoctrination you know and it's like I don't want to move back to where my parents came from which is where uh, I'll be but you know it might have to happen I think these any suggestions on on the group? They have? Um no, somebody asked about identity and I think Amira was saying the same thing, like, um, what is your Islamic identity and how that overlaps with your American identity? Yeah, and is Islam an identity anyway? Yeah. That's the other discussion. Islam is a faith. Right. That's another discussion. Um, I think these are great uh, suggestions and I think when you if you look at like the seventh chapter of the Quran if you have a chance to read it this week uh, or I think the 13th so who, 11th chapter 11th chapter you find that the prophets are dealing with a host of issues whether it's economic issues like Shuaib whether it's political oppression like Musa whether it's sexual ethics and morality like Prophet Lut um, so you find that the prophets are not simply saying like, hey, worship God, right? They're saying worship God, of course, which is like the crux, but then they are addressing, they have language. What are prophets really? Prophets are the religious verbiage, which we believe is divine. It is a vessel of divine religious communication. One of the biggest challenges, and this is what I like to sometimes when I get invited to the imam councils and stuff that I used to be on years ago before I quit, um, is to say, like, what, what's the language that you're providing Muslims to talk about LGBTQ issues? Because if you don't provide people language, they become like Adam if he didn't have the names of things in dunya. Mm -hmm. Like, how would Adam have functioned without language? How does theology, Islamic theology, speak to issues of race? And when we don't have language, then that makes us culpable to either the right or the left. Right? Because at the end of the day, if we were to take the extreme right or the extreme left and apply it to the Sahaba, there would be no Sahaba. They'd have all been canceled. Like the family of the Prophet would have been canceled because they their assumed proximity to the Prophet therefore renders them unable to be worthy of leadership. Omar's past would have had him canceled. Um, Sula, um, Sayl, um, um Salama, because of her husband. Hind, because of her father. So we also have a struggle of emancipating ourselves from being stuck into the frameworks of the right and the left. And there are certainly intersectionalities between both. Like, have concerns about the ethical issues of the left? Well, the right, they want to see people die of COVID-19. And they're so married to white supremacy and anti-Muslim bigotry like, it's very hard to align with them on any value piece. So I like to tell people, I think I mentioned this to you all a few weeks ago, or like last week, I was talking with a person who was on Senator Sanders' campaign. Very good guy. He was telling me, this is my political theology. I mean, this is my political philosophy. Political philo I said, what's your political theology? He said, I don't have one. I said, how are you going to work for Islam, man? Right? You're doing Islam. 
You're doing your best. <laughs> so one of the challenges, and that wasn't to stop him from doing what he's doing. There's nobody equipping him. There's nobody sitting and listening and saying, okay, how do we think through these issues? So a, a bigger challenge is a challenge of what we just talked about now. Those early scholars, why do we love them? Because they were able to contextualize Islam and Islamic issues in a way that brought added value to people's lives and held them responsible. If we get caught up in just arguing about arguing, <laughs> we're not going to be. So one of the things that we're going to do in this class from time to time is let you try to work out issues. The evangelical community, the more balanced evangelicals, has issues on sexual morality where they call it welcoming but not affirming. That's language. Welcome everybody. I don't have to affirm everybody. The challenge now, as you talked about, Ahi, is that you could lose your job, man. You could lose your career. You could lose everything by taking like BDS positions. You could lose your job. And that also touches on something that we'll talk about in the future when we look at critical theory. And I talked about this in a Friday sermon a few weeks ago, is that all power is not bad. Right? And, and collectively, in New York City, do we have power as a community to do what we want to do? To say what we need to say? To speak our truth? So there's, there's the, the 10 people promised paradise around the prophet, eight of them would have been today millionaires. Not encouraging anyone just to be opulent. Right? But what I'm saying is they were able to support. They were able to, to, to look after the needs of the community. And sometimes what I think in nonprofits, I worked in nonprofits for a long time, is that there's grand ideas, but there's not the financial capacity to get it done and then people get mad like what we're the greatest ummah why aren't these things happening we're the best ummah well then put some money where your mouth is let's hire a staff to run the masjid let's hire an executive director let's not have someone volunteer doing the accounting who has a degree in education right like <laughs> me right should be an accountant right Let's have Sunday school teachers that are actually like educators. Let's not just simply go for the Southwest model. We got great peanuts, but we're not giving you any mansa for biryani. <laughs> then you can't, I can't expect, I can't expect if I don't put in. So in the very beginning, the Prophet ﷺ, this is in the Quran, if you wanted to talk to the Prophet, and to qaddimu bayni yaday najawakum sadaqa, you had to give charity, not to him, to the community. Because why? How will they scale? So we're going to unpack these as time goes on, but I want to try to kind of expand, and I really appreciate these co you know, comments and ideas. When we talk about Iman, as we go through the different issues of Iman, the foundations of Iman come from, from the Qur'an, what we believe in. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَنْ يَكْفُرْ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُوبِهِ وَرُسُولِهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَقَدَ ضَلَّ ضَالًا بَعِيدًا Allah says in Shurt Nisa, who doesn't believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, and the hereafter has gone astray. Allah says, إِنَّا خَلَقَنَا كُلَّ شَيْءٍ بِقَدْرٍ We created everything with measurement. قَضَاءٍ قَدْرٍ قَدْر. الَّذِي قَدَّرَهِ فَهَدَى then we have the famous narration of the Prophet وسلم, when the man came to the Prophet والسلام, and he asked the Prophet, Mal Iman, what's Iman? And the Prophet وسلم, said to believe in Allah, his angels, his books, his messengers, day of judgment, and to believe in preordainment. Fate. Qada and Qadr. The good and the bad is from Allah. These are the six agreed upon foundations of belief. Someone believes these, alhamdulillah, they're Muslim. Allah, angels, books, messengers, hereafter, qada and qadr. Khalas. There are three things that we need to know about this quickly. Number one is that the common, regular, Muslim folk 
are not obligated to believe the particular issues related to these topics. So, for example, we've all ran into, you know, my wife, her, her grandmother now, is, is, she survived COVID, man, 92 years old, mashallah, because she just always, like, in vicar. I think she had the vicar for COVID, man, just making salawat. <laughs> just, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, Allahumma salli hey. Mashallah, 92? <laughs> but if you told her, you know, in the Quran it said tomorrow's the day of judgment, she would start crying. She wouldn't be like, you know, who said it? Where is it said? What scholar said this? What group said this? What sheikh said this? She would really like change herself. There's a, a simplicity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually commands us to have. Doesn't mean that we're not intellectual, but al badala tu min al-iman. The hadith says simplicity is from iman. So most scholars of theology say that what's obligated upon a Muslim to believe is to just say, I believe in Allah. I believe in the hereafter. I believe in prophets. And that's why it's a problem when people become Muslim. We're like, what do you mean when you say Allah? Leave these people alone, man. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he didn't do that to people. Alayhi salatu salam. The second thing uh, that we want to talk about is this mistranslation. And I think this is very important as we continue for next week. And that is that the translation I believe in is incorrect. You need to pay attention to this because this may possibly be very transformative. And if you need to check your phone, I'm not, I don't get upset, don't worry. I know. I got, I got a, a baby and a wife, so I'm like, yeah, okay, thank good. That's how it is. I don't want you to feel uh, intimidated or anything. You know, you do what you have to do. You're students, young folks. I like to tell my daughter, she's 20, being young gives you more of an excuse to make mistakes. We're the ones that, <laughs> that don't have any excuses, right? But the translation is not correct. I believe in Allah. You don't say, Aman tu fila. You don't say, I believe in God. You say, Aman tu billah. The word be in Arabic means with. That's why you say, Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. I begin with the names of Allah. Why? Because when you say with Allah, this implies more than just a set of the theoretical constructions. This means that I actually live as though I'm with God. And we know that the Prophet وسلم, in the same hadith that I talked about earlier about the man who came and asked him these questions, he said to worship Allah as though you what? As though you see him. Of course, God doesn't have a gender. It's just like. So when I say, Aman tu billah, this implies I am now going to live a life of responsibility. Because I am not alone. I am being watched. I am being observed. And if you think about this, this can impact us in an infinite number of ways. Our scholars said that there are eight situations in life. That's it, eight. One of my teachers, he made a poem in Arabic. He said, There are eight situations that people will find themselves in. There's no escaping these eight. Sadness, happiness. Sometimes we're happy. Sometimes we're sad. Under this can be anxiety, euphoria, uh, euphoria. All this can be packed under this. Separating and being together. Like now we're here, we're going to separate some. Life and death. To be sufficient, to sometimes be wanting. And sickness and, 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 and health. That's it. If you take those eight and you look at the stories of the prophets in the Quran, you're going to find always one of these eight. Sadness, happiness. Being with people, being separated. Hijrah, separation. The prophet's death, separation. 
coming to meet Medina, being united in euphoria. You're not going to be able to like escape it or any different iteration of one of these. Health and sickness. So when we say amantu billah, that means that Islam teaches us proper manners to live in these eight scenarios. And the main foundational manner is worship. So like I'm on, we say, I'm on my deen. I used to say that back in the days. That brother's on his deen. Right? I'm on my religion. But for example, what would be the etiquette of success that Iman teaches us? What's the etiquette of success? Gratitude. لَإِن شَكَرْتُمْ مُونِ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Allah says, if you express gratitude to me, I will increase you. What will be the etiquette of struggling, not making ends meet? To work hard, of course, but to be resilient. Allah says, وَلَسَوْفُ يُعْتِيكَ رَبُّكَ فَتَرْضَى What's coming later is better for you. What's the etiquette of being together? Imam al-Ghazali mentions in his Ihya Ulum al 12 etiquettes, etiquettes of Suhbah. How do we treat one? And I think we can add to these now. When we hear our sister say, because of my color, I was made to feel this way in a masjid. This needs to be highlighted as a community that we make sure we don't tokenize people also. That's, that's the problem. We just treat people like people. But it's not that hard. Just be good to people. That should be added now. The issues of gender and how they play out in the Muslim community. The challenges we find, even interpretation. How do we revisit certain components of interpretation to make sure that people don't feel less valued because of their gender? Especially if those issues of interpretation are theoretic. Right? These are coming from scholars, not coming from, from God and His Messenger. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How would we deal with sickness? The Prophet Sallallahu mentioned there's like more than 40 to 50 hadith about like the rewards of being sick and how sickness is an expiation for sin. And this can in, you know, help us with our chaplaincy programs and our ministry programs. How do we deal with health? We don't engage in the haram. All the brothers I converted with, mashallah, they still look young, even though they're like 50, 47, 48. So whenever we go back to the old neighborhood in Oklahoma, we run into the brothers and sisters that did not convert with us, who may have lived a life of debauchery and heathenry. They basically look like they're about 97 years old. <laughs> and so they ask, like they asked my friend Sheikh Abdul Samad, man, how come you look so young? He said, no swine and no wine. <laughs> No swine, no wine. And they're like, what? It's like, man, I don't drink, man. I don't smoke. Since I'm 20 years old, I haven't smoked. I haven't drank. I haven't put injections in my backside. <laughs> right? I haven't done things to my body. They're like, man, Islam is the truth. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> they want to use the Islam serum. <laughs> but... There's, there's, there's an appreciation for health, right? The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that health is a blessing that most people fail to capitalize on. May Allah give us all good health. So for each one of these eight is, the point is, we find in the Qur'an a way that we should interact with those things, which is a sign of Iman. So therefore, Iman is with the moment. And that's why Hidayah, is from a hadiyah. What's hadiyah? Hadiyah is a present. So guidance is the gift of your presence now. You do what you do in the present in the right way. That's why it's a gift. You make the right choice. When we talk about this as we finish, this witness is going to play out in a number of ways that we're going to talk about. Because the greater our understanding that we're not alone, Hopefully, the better we'll act. One of the biggest challenges is self-determination. Talked about it earlier. How do I take responsibility for all this?
So the first is if I say, Amantu Billah, I believe with Allah, then I'm going to do my best and we all, I, every one of us, fail. I'm not perfect, we all screw up. When I say, Amantu Billah, that means I'm going to make the right choices. What does God want from me? What does Allah command me? And this kind of like goes back to the questions that you were bringing up, right? Like this kind of tsunami of ultra-liberal kind of intolerance coupled with like far-right lunacy and hatred can feel kind of like overburdening. That's why I like to tell Muslims, like, free yourself from both. Be prophetic. Be a prophetic moralist. And we have a challenge, right? We're politically conservative and socially liberal. We look after the weak. We, we believe that we are commanded to, to look after people who are mistreated. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we find ourselves in a weird place. Same thing with angels. How do I live with angels? We're going to talk about that. Can you see an angel? Yeah. No. Can you meet an angel? Yes. You might meet an angel in Washington Square Park. <laughs> you might. It's the purpose of angels. How do I live a life where I know that the angels are with me? One of the scholars said, when we believe in angels, then we always have someone to talk to. It's like a beautiful thing, man. There's always companionship. Because we don't want to simply frame this witness in, this, uh, in the sense of, like, we're getting tickets all the time. No, like, Allah has your back. You should be, like, brave. I'm not alone here. I'm doing my best. Same thing with Malaika. The books. How do I live with the book? The book is teaching me how to live. The Quran. That's why the strong opinion is the word Quran is from Qara'a, which means to join. Because it makes you whole. How do I live with prophets? that I, I try to keep the Prophet's examples in front of me as the GPS for my work. Mm -hmm. And that those are like immutable teachings. Everything else is open for interpretation, right? Prophets, it's kind of a different issue. If it gets to interpretation of what the Prophet said, of course, then there's leeway. But if the Prophet said like, be good to your mom, it's like, okay. What what's Connor, what does Connor say about being good to your mom? Be a good husband. Like, is there a hadith that says don't be a good husband? Absolutely not. So that I follow their example in worship, in character, and morality, in areas that they taught and touched on. So I'm actually with them now, because each and every one of us, especially as a member of Muhammad's community, Ali Salam, we are extensions of the Prophet's teaching. And that's why, you know, I always think it's funny when people say, I'm such a bad Muslim. You know, I can't make da'wah. I, I can't have any impact. I honestly believe that it's the sinful Muslim that will have a bigger impact on sinful non-Muslims than the sheikh. Because the sheikh might not be... They might not understand what this guy's talking about. And I mentioned, I think, in one of the halakas, my friend Abdul Hakim is shooting heroin with a brother from Algeria or something. And then the guy shoots heroin, he's like, stuff a lot, man. Then they nod out. They come back and he's like, what were you saying? He's like, I was asking God for forgiveness. <laughs> he's like, why well, were shooting heroin? <laughs> and he was like, you know, I just feel like, you know, God's with me. And then Abdul Hakim is like, click, goes to the masjid, moves to Mauritania, memorizes the Quran, learns Arabic. Changes his life. One of my teachers used to say, Fusaqa'una awliya'uhum. Fusaqa'una awliya'uhum. Are the sinful Muslim, we're all sinful, but he means like, ratchet. <laughs> they are the awliya of the non-Muslims. Mm. I've seen this with some family members who were like, they'll meet one of my Muslim friends from college who wasn't like, you know, so aligned. And then my brother would be like, you know that guy Ahmad, like he is so religious. 
And I'm like, dude, Ahmad got issues, bro. <laughs> like, <laughs> like Ahmad is not the guy. He's like, you know, and then he told my mom, told me, like, he's not like you. You're crazy. <laughs> and my mother, God bless her, when there was that show, All American Muslim, I know you guys may have been too young, and there was a lady that had the bar in Detroit. And then my mom called me. She's like, I've been watching this show, and I have learned so much about you, more than you could have ever taught me. I was like, what the heck is she watching? <laughs> I thought she was watching Adam's World or something. <laughs> and she was like, this show, All American Muslim? And I was like, oh, God, not that show. <laughs> oh, you know, stuff while I was, I was young, a little arrogant thing, you know? And then she said, especially the lady who owns the bar, her struggle between righteousness and vice, I, I found Jesus in that. And I was like, wow, man, you know, your son goes to Azhar, he can't teach you one thing. The lady on the <laughs> show about the bar, you learn more from. Why? Because there's the aptitude, and that's why we have to be very appreciative of the fact that the majority of the people who become Muslim in the time of the Prophet are doing it through relationships with people around the Prophet. Alayhi salatu salam. So never underestimate our importance. No matter what we are, we are extensions of prof prophecy. So when we're with the prophet, even in sin, when we feel repentant and we feel penitent and we feel, you know, I need to be better, that's out of uh, uh, that relationship we have with Sayyidina Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. How do we live with the hereafter? You know, what kind of choices do I make? How do I treat people? Prophet said that a person will be punished in the hereafter and he will say, why am I being punished like this? And the angel will say to him, because you passed by the oppressed and you didn't help them. So there has to be some kind of, the, the, the belief in the hereafter is going to be translated into a, a different way, a different attitude. And it's going to allow me to escape like opulence and irresponsible materialism and, you know, things that have no value. And then finally, belief with God's plan. That's tough, man. That's why the Prophet said to believe twice. He said to believe in Allah, His angels, His books, His messengers, the Day of Judgment, and to believe. Why does he mention the verb again? Because most of us are going to have a problem with that. Why have bad things happen to good people? Albania? Bosnia in the 90s, man. I, I met refugees that came from there. Now, Afghanistan, in the Arab Spring. I was in Cairo during the Arab Spring. So the impact sometimes of fate, and as we talked about on Tuesdays, that's why Imam Ghazali says trauma and pain are one of the biggest challenges to faith. How do I live with Allah through success? How do I live with Qada and Qadr? through challenges. So that's how we're going to approach this, man. We're not going to sit here and just go into theory. There's going to be a theoretical component. But what I want us to take in our discussions, and I want to take from you, is how do I live this, man? How do I put this into play? How do I find the ability to translate faith in that moment where I find, like, what do I need to do here? In tattaqullaha yaja'alakum furqana. Allah says, if you fear me, if you obey me, I'll give you the ability to see. How do you put on the VR of iman? Right, how, do you, how do you see through that? So again, the foundations of faith are six. With Allah. So now we're going to say in. Say with. With Allah. With his angels with his books, with his prophets, with the hereafter, with fate. Then that also touches on a lot of other things, like liberation theory, liberation theology in the Muslim world. Is that coming because of in or with the changes that need to happen in the world around us? Is that going to be just simply, now sometimes you get frustrated with religious people. It's so theoretical, man. All this theory, arguing about this dude from... I was in one time, Ezra, they were arguing about a guy named Qari Abdul Jabbar. I thought Qari Abdul Jabbar was down the street. Because, like, the way they're talking about him, it's like Nas and Jay-Z in the ether. Like, 
in the early 2000s. It was like, man, this guy, Qadi Abdul Jabbar, is a problem. So then I was like, Ain al Masjid Bita'al al Qadi Dal Abdul Jabbar, though. Where is his masjid? And they were like, La Damat, he died 1,000 years ago. <laughs> I said, Well, I thought he was alive, man. The way you're talking about him, he's alive. Then I said, We, and these were amongst students, not amongst professors, we are arguing about somebody is dead? Right? So, those important historical figures, yes, but we need to learn about historical figures to be able to shine into our situation. So we'll stop here and next week we'll continue with our text, inshallah. And it looks like the rain is still there. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions, thoughts, or comments? Uh, how does it feel to hear with instead of in? What does that do? Yes, Suraya. Um. I just want to say, we had a really, a really good conversation with her, but just touching again about how, oh, touching, again, touching again about how a lot of the times in this, like this dunya is written, us, written to us, like we have classes that are even about the, the absence of God in spaces, and just like how we tend to learn this world as like a godless one, right? But then subhanAllah, like this hadith and everything that tells us that Allah SWT made this world. Like, he made it full of faith and beauty, and everything is in worship of him constantly. But it's crazy how in academia, in so much of our lives, and in so much of uh, conversations, even with just our peers, there's such an absence of God, and there's such an absence of space in the conversations in their paradigms. But subhanAllah, like, through this class, I also just understand that I'm a person that believes that the angels are with us in these type of gatherings, that they exist, that they are there. So it's inshallah, engaging in those type of conversations will be good. There's a great book, I don't know if I put it on the syllabus by uh, Professor Harvey Cox out of Harvard. <laughs> Professor Cox is an amazing person, man. God extended his life. I think he's about 93. He used to ride a bicycle to the masjid, man, from Cambridge. Oh. In Roxbury. <laughs> he used to ride a bicycle to the hood. <laughs> he's like such a cool guy. But he wrote this book called The Secular City. In 1973, I believe is when this book was written. But basically, he says something very profound in that book that is the theme of the book, and that is religious communities tend to react to secular moments by pulling back. Mm -hmm. So they won't engage, right? They're, they're like, no, I'm good, man. Stuff like that. Where he's like, whereas prophecy, and he's speaking from a Christian tradition, but I don't think we have a problem with this. Prophecy equips us to engage the most secular situation. Mm -hmm. The prophets were sent to the faithful. Allah says about them, you, they were, you were really astray. He doesn't just say you were lost. He's like, you were magnificently lost. <laughs> yeah. So he says, perhaps religious communities would be wise to figure out a strategy of engagement. Mm. Because if they pull away from the secular, then they can't complain about the secular's growth. Mm. Because there's no one there to push back. And say, no, God is He. Well, the Quran says, Wahu ma'akum aina ma'akuntum. Allah is with you wherever you are. Walilahi al mashriq wal maghrib. Allah has control over all things. Walilahi mulku samawati wa ma'afil ard. So it's, it's a really good, I think it's on the syllabus uh, part of that text, but he writes about this in a very, very succinct way, like it's nice. Yes, sir. But when we're talking about. Engaging with Quran uh, and like helping to guide society back onto the right path. Um, the prophets themselves had like a direct connection with Allah, the and they had the ability to always be grounded. Uh, but we don't have uh, that lifeline. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a great we, question. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, and that and that's why. First of all, we have to be rooted in revelation and then secondly the prophet also mentioned that the effort cannot compromise of course we're not going to can't compromise our religious principles but sometimes in oklahoma we say the best remedy for the snake bite is the poison and that's why converts become extremely strategically important in america 
because they can wade through the currents of jahiliya and pull cats out. I have given a shahada in a dope house. I did it. Five guys at once in Oklahoma. But I know that neighborhood. I know that street, 85th Street. I know that street. Right? So that's not everybody's job. But at the same time, if we see like people like, look at Masjid Taqwa in Brooklyn, when they moved there in the early 80s, you know, it's like the worst area. What did they do? They went to the drug dealers and called them to Allah. They went to the prostitutes and called them to Allah. Mm-hmm. And, there, and some brothers may have got lost, but a lot of people came in. And can we think of one moment in the life of the Prophet where he didn't call people to Allah? He used those people's sin as an excuse not to work? Or his companions. So we have to think of strategy. Not everybody has the same... Like, I I can't speak to Afghan refugees who just came to America. Someone can. When the Bosnian and Albanian communities came in the 90s, that was one of the challenges we had. We didn't have that many, we had old Bosnian communities, old Albanian communities, right? That that even American Muslims didn't know about. Mm. So we weren't in a position to think strategically like who, who can help these people. So again, every community has communities. And every communities have their own responsibilities. And we need to appreciate strategy. How do, we, how do we address certain specific things and understand that not everybody is made to go into the dope house and give shahada? Yeah. I couldn't go into a dope house here and do it. <laughs> I do it there because that's where I was from. Right? So there, there is a, a role that each and every one of us plays. But we need to be connected to revelation. Because we can't complain about the sick if we don't let them in the hospital. Mm. And the sins of people are not necessarily an excuse for me not to care about them. Of course, I'm not going to put myself in a scenario where I I had a friend in college. He used to go to the club. (laughs) MashaAllah. He gave dawah? And he (laughs) he gave dawah. So he came to us in the, the, the... you know, he had that look of that he was out somewhere. So he came, he would come up for a Fajr prayer, man. One time, I will lie, he fell asleep in the uh, Sajud. <laughs> we should, that would be a great uh, sitcom, man. Those converts from Oklahoma in the early 90s. <laughs> but then we ask him, like, man, what's wrong with you, man? Look how you're dressed. He's like, man, I met this girl, you know what I'm saying? I'm giving her a dawah at the club. <laughs> And then our Sheikh, who's now actually McDaw from Sheikh Abdul Rahman, is in the ICU, who gave me Shahada, he's 82 years old, uh, with COVID. Mm-hmm. Sheikh Abdul Rahman said to him, no, brother, I think you're getting a dawah. <laughs> 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 I think you're giving dawah. I think you're being invited. You can't invite nobody. <laughs> it's like, oh man, I'm going to zawaj that girl, man. I'm going to marry that girl. You know, she's going to become a Muslim. <laughs> Sheikh was like, Ahi. Brother, come sit down. You need to relax. So, we, huh? Give him his fantasy. It was his fantasy, man. Yeah, you you know. But that's why you gotta have some protection. You have to have some protection around you, (laughs) or some cystection. You know. He's like, man, alhamdulillah, she's close, man. She got it reading. You gotta read the Quran. I was like, at the club as well, right? <laughs> Out there. <laughs> Reading the Quran. <laughs> I don't know what happened. I can maybe follow up. Maybe his fantasy came true. <laughs> Brother used to make long duas. <laughs> but the Sheikh told him, You are being invited. <laughs> You're not inviting <laughs> And then we were like, What's it like, man? Is the club still good? <laughs> we were still, we were still infected, right? <laughs> so we haven't fully been sanitized. And he's like, "Yo, did you see Michelle over there, man?" <laughs> Shaker like, "You're corrupting the Holocaust." <laughs> but you know, we have a, a responsibility to to do that. 
you know, insert, if, if it presents itself. So like now, where I live, there's some individuals who are engaged in a open air pharmacy. So, <laughs> so the open air pharmacy is kind of by my house. It has a very distinct smell, like a skunk. So last Friday, as I'm going to Tandon, I'm going to Tandon tomorrow. So I was going to Tandon, they were like, yo, get out the way, man, get out the way. And I was like, oh, dang, what did I do, right? That guy's Muslim, get out of the way. So they, they cleared the sidewalk, and it became like church board. <laughs> well, light. And then one of them, I swear to God, he said, Salaikum Salam. <laughs> and I said, Wa Alaikum Salam, Wa Rahmatullahi, Wa Barakatuh. Well, next time, I'm giving him da'wah. Inshallah. Next time, I'm gonna invite them here. Inshallah. Oh yeah, they're not they're not NYU students. Right? I can't invite them there. To the park. I can invite them to honest shops. Yeah, I'll invite them to honest shops. Uh, if I see them, yeah, I'll invite them to to Tandon for a. They can't get in campus, man. Oh yeah. But like, my plan is, hey, Imam Siraj, you to talk about dawa openings. Mm, yeah. And I, w I actually want to say, like, you know what, man? You guys got good in you, dude. Like, look how respectful you are, bro. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I don't even know you. Yeah. They were like, that guy's Muslim. Get out the way, man. Clear the sidewalk. <laughs> Slaykum <laughs> Salaam. <laughs> said, Slaykum <laughs> Salaam. <laughs> no bake. That's how you do it. You got to have, you know, you got to be ready to give dawah. Because you can't <laughs> complain about people if you're not trying to be there for people in different ways. That's not my fantasy, by the way. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But it's important. Any other uh, thoughts about what we heard tonight besides the story of uh, the brother whose name will not be said? He's married now, man. Shall I got kids? <laughs> Don't know who to marry, though. You may find out. Yes, Ahi. Yeah, I actually wrote a, it's not done, but I'm working on the book and I actually have this in that book. How? In, in just leaves me at like a philosophical point. God is transcendent, I suck. That's kind of, that's kind of what it means, right? <laughs> right? But when it's like with, and of course Allah is with, not physically with, transcendent with. And we're going to talk about this in this class. How do you, how do you cause transcendence and nearness to work? How does that work? Right? How do we infirm Allah's transcendence beyond space and time? Not up, not down, not north, not east, no gender, none of that. But then he's super close to you. How do you do that? That's one of the brilliance of Islamic theology, actually. Because Christians had to make God a man to do that. People had to make idolatry to, to solve the problem of transcendence. Or Islam says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ariyun Hakim. But Harib, how close to you? And that's like powerful. So I'm glad you caught that because I, I was going to talk about it. I was like, I'm not going to say anything. But it's actually in a text I'm writing, explanation of this poem that we're going to learn. One, one of the reasons I'm doing this, I get your questions. I want to put this in this book. <laughs> right? So then it's, no, I don't want to just write what I think. It's easy sitting against the wall. Okay. When you hear from people, it becomes much more impactful. Yes, sir. Um, I've also heard that you can't say things like, well, this is what I've heard, I'm not saying this is true, but that you can't say things like Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is everywhere, like, he's right next to you, like, um, you can say those things like, oh, what about the bathroom, or something, something like that, Allah's not there, um, and like, how do you relate that to... Yeah, we're going to talk about that, Allah's knowledge is everywhere, man, right. restroom, whatever. because if Allah's knowledge wasn't in the, in the restroom, Right? Then that would mean his knowledge is what? 
is limited, and if his knowledge is limited, he can't be beyond matter. God does not get grossed out by the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but Allah created the just. I think the idea he was referring to is like pantheism, because like God is in everything. Yeah, physically in everything. Yeah. yeah. This is not what we're talking about. Here, of course. <laughs> That's a good question. No, but this is out there. I've seen this online, by the way. Yeah. This argument. Good. Yes, sir. Yeah, I also find the idea of saying I believe with Allah the way it's like being very powerful because like in the Quran throughout you see Allah Himself declaring declaring that there's no one worship worth worshiping but him so he takes the shahada, he's always doing that uh, tes- testifying, the angels don't testify as everyone birth and everyone testifies it. So it's like when you say with kinda of gets you into that. To godliness, you're like joining something that is already existing. You're not like, oh, you're not like making a declaration, you're just affirming like something that is already true. So that like to godliness that you would feel with, uh, with I think that's pretty powerful. Think about when you say I'm in love with somebody. Mm-hmm. When I when I say I'm in love with somebody, it should be of course the with that they've defined for this witness, by the way. But then that involves I'm now responsible in the relationship. But if I just say, you know, I believe in God, that kind of limits me from being physically responsible. I'm intellectually there, but when I say, with, now we can appreciate when Allah says, remember me, I what? I remember you. That's great. Any other thoughts before we go? Yes, sir. Your name, brother, again? Amadou. Amadou. Yes. You mentioned earlier something about uh, the Christians' approach to uh, like LGBT traditions where they have this uh, like welcomeness but no affirmation. I feel like for the past uh, college year, I've tried like to uh, get that approach with my friends who are uh, non-Muslim doing certain things or then up to also to the LGBTQ. But uh, I feel like I'm reaching to I'm reaching a point where like it's very hard for me to differentiate differentiate between welcoming and affirming just like you know when it gets very close it's kind of like hard to make the difference so it's like I was wondering if, if you have like any uh, sort of like ways to navigate that like narrow like path or if you know just get this question great successful relationships are always consisting of healthy boundaries mm-hmm. Right, marriage, friends, work, play. Uh, what we have our own boundaries. What makes us disciplined? Like right now, all day I'm like, I have to go home and read this Pepsi. Mm-hmm. My wife's not home right now. She's in DC, so it's just on my mind. Whatever I do, I got to get out of here. Got to go through that. That's a boundary. So now if I run into Khalid, mm-hmm. and he's like, Hey, man. I just got an Oculus Plus 2, because <laughs> I got one too yesterday. <laughs> so fun. We're actually going to try to make a Muslim app for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's going to be kind of cool. Make, sign the DNR on it. Uh, in our, in our whatever. The, 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 what is it? I forgot, man. The disclosure oh, clause. No. No, this NDA. 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 <laughs> so, so I, I had to remind my study hadith that he him. Leave me alone. I'm sorry. So I... Everyone, Rehem is a bully. Don't, that's on the internet. Cancel culture. <laughs> that's on the internet. Rehem, it's not her real name. So, anyways, like, I have to be disciplined. I have to have a boundary. So, I, I, I have a problem with any relationship, even with religious people, that can't respect boundaries, man. So, you want to be able to have real conversations. If these are real friends, I have a friend of mine, God help him, but friends in Oklahoma who are not Muslim, who they are still just like regular, you know, I don't know how to explain it, man, just wild people, sort of. But I'm like, if I'm, if I'm going to be with you guys, like, this is not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Right? And then if they're like, well, can we, can we do this instead of this? Or, you know, then we can negotiate. But the point is, that's a healthy, like, those are healthy relationships. But if it's like, it's going to be like this, 
or I'm not going to talk to you anymore. You want to stay away. And those are people who don't respect you. Right? Regardless of if it's a romantic relationship, friendship, work, school, even professors. You should not be around people that treat me this way as much as I can. So I think it's just having a healthy conversation. And maybe even saying, this is how I feel, man. Like, I feel like I'm not tolerated. Right? Like, there has to be, like, a mutual sense of tolerance here. That kind of goes back to what you were talking about earlier. Like, there has to be, you know, when are we going to talk about, like, I, I hate to say this because the right uses this in really weird ways, but, like, there's, like, an anti-religious slant to a lot of this stuff. So I feel suffocated religiously, but this is what I believe. But because I believe it, this is what I noticed about people that are very secular, that they, sin they tend to amplify religion's punishments more than faithful people do. So you find like people that are somewhat secular, like, well, because you think I'm a sinner, you're going to kill me, and you hate me, and you're going to blow up my house and destroy my life. <laughs> you're like, no, no, we can still be friends. <laughs> I just don't affirm that part of your life. <laughs> right? Like, they're not able to appreciate that there is nuance. And then that's not, it, it's not, of course, helped when we run into people that, like, are very immature religious. Yeah. Like the sheikh, the guy's like, I was at the club. Sheikh wasn't like, stuff a lot, brother. Blah, blah, blah. He was like, I think you're the one getting down, right? <laughs> like, it's funny, but like, there is a really strong lesson in what he said, right? But it's like, he's not shaming the person. And, and that's why I talked about on Tuesday. We need to avoid getting caught up in the, the behavioral ethos of America. And I was like, everybody's just fighting, man. Nobody can talk through anything. Go to YouTube, and if you can find the debate between James Baldwin and William F. Buckley Jr. These are people on the complete opposite spectrum of everything. But they talk with grace, respect. They talk firm. Right? And there's some things I don't think we need to be necessarily nice about. I might not agree sometimes, but their ability to have like just a conversation. And you find, and there's a great article in the Atlantic written by um, Shahdi Ahmed on how politics has become the theology of the West. And that's why people are passionate about it. They're passionate about like it's faith. I'm not, I'm not about that, man. Yes, sir. It's just like a word of advice like, in my like, private life as well. So, like, I started like with a religion when I was like, maybe like, <laughs> and like I've had conversations with friends from like when I was that age and they still have that like mm -hmm. perception that Islam is like that from the things I told them like four or five years ago you know so like when you're having these conversations with these people like be very cognizant of the fact that their their experience of Islam like would be only limited to you and the things Told me that. <laughs> like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop the bomb. On you know, <laughs> and then, like you know, ten years later, they're gonna bring it up. And you're gonna say like, "Oh my God!" Like, what? <laughs> you still remember that? Like, <laughs> yeah. it happened with my parents. Yeah. yeah, I messed up my relationship with my parents for like ten years because the first year I was just hard, bro. My mom started buying halal meat, man. Not even Muslim. Going to the halal store. My son told me. And they're like, this is the FBI agent here. <laughs> Allow me, dude. That's <laughs> the weirdest thing. <laughs> She's like going and buying hello. My mom was saying, mashallah. She's like, oh, oh was I supposed to say, oh, the bala, mashallah. I get confused. Right? But it took a long time. I think that's why it's important. Like, there's a community organizing the idea of an old, the old friend mentality. It's like, let's center our friendship as the foundation of the conversation. So then it comes like, we're, we're, we're talking about this as friends. So if, if we say something inadvertent, or if one of us gets upset, let's talk through it. And make sure that we don't, you know, at 16 that's hard. 
you know, but let's let's try to make sure that we don't leave. Like, if we disagree, we disagree respectfully. You know, and I think that's that's good to always kind of talk in front of the conversation sometime to catch ourselves and then to set it so we're not immediately like, you know, it takes and that's friendship, man. That's real relationship. Shall I? One more minute. <laughs> Gonna go in the rain again. Get that organic cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> Came in soaked. It was awesome. Uh, but I think it's important that we remember some of the things we heard, um, and then that we become committed to like not being part of that negative thing that we heard, and just like working for it better. Uh, and then next week we'll continue with the poem. We'll start with learning talk about these 20 attributes related to God that scholars talk about most people need to know and we'll move on to prophets, angels, books, uh, messengers, and we'll talk about the family of the Prophet over the next few weeks uh, and then we'll be finished with this section inshallah.